very warm wel welcome to all of you uh, for this panel. Uh, we have with us four panelists, very experienced investors in the consumer space. Uh, I'm just going to quickly introduce uh, all of them. Uh, Imran Jafar on my uh, extreme right uh, from Gaja Capital. Uh, they've made uh, investments in companies such as Chumbak Designs, Baker Circle, Yoro Kids, which is a preschool chain. Um, and also they recently exited John Distilleries earlier this year. Um, then we have Ketki Paranchpe from L. Catterton, uh, Asia. They've, uh, the recent investments include Impresario Hospitality and uh, uh, Future Lifestyle. Um, Tarun Khanna from CX Partners. Uh, key investments include Mrs. Bechter's food, Foods, Sapphire Foods and Barbecue Nation. And uh, finally, Ro uh, Rochelle D'Souza of Lighthouse uh, Funds. Uh, they've, they've made many investments recently, uh, including Fab India, Mo Wa Momos, Bekaji, Nika, and, uh, and also an interesting company called Tynor. Uh, so thank you so much uh, to, to the panel. And uh, if I can, uh, you know, begin with uh, Imran on, uh, you know, can you take us through uh, why some of those investments that you've made recently in, a, in say, a souvenir company um, or, or a liquor brand were interesting for you as a firm? Um, sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ranjini. So uh, let me, I know there was a few slides on macro, but just a few quick bullet points on, you know, what's going on here. When we, when we set up Gaja in 2005, the total consumer uh, economy in India was roughly $350 uh, billion. And, uh, you know, today that's $1.5 trillion. Um, and we think this is going to be a $6 trillion consumer economy in the next 10 years. Um, now, these numbers are eye-popping. Um, but what is very interesting is the incremental consumer spend between now and the next 10 years is going to be $5 trillion. Um, so when you, when you look at consumer, uh, you know, in 2005, when we went on fundraising show, uh, you know, road shows, we used to apologetically say, look at consumer demand in PPP terms, right? Purchase power parity terms. Today, we don't need that crutch. This is um, the third, this is going to be the third largest consumer economy in the world in absolute dollar terms. So first of all, that's the overriding, um, uh, you know, uh, momentum that you're seeing in the market. Um, the other thing is, if you look at this $5 trillion and break it down, um, there is, of course, the, you know, the normal categories that are growing, which is, uh, you know, just more of the same, people are consuming more. But premiumization and new categories are going to add between one and one and a half trillion dollars of new annual spend over the next 10 years. So if you're an entrepreneur looking at disrupting a market, creating new categories, uh, innovating through new channels, et cetera, you have a massive one and a half, it's almost as big as it is today, of incremental spend coming uh, your way in the next 10 years. And so that's the backdrop. And so uh, we invested in you know, these trends. For example, our investment in John Distilleries was on the back of the fact that you know, we will consume more alcohol, obviously, but then we, we, you know, consumer tastes in alcohol are going to shift. So in John Distilleries, which we recently exited through Sazerac, which is a U.S.-based company, uh, I think the breakout uh, value creator there was a single malt from India called Paul John, which we sell in 30 countries. Uh, and so this is very unique in the Indian context. Uh, you've heard of Japanese uh, single malts taking over the world, but, you know, there was a market for world whiskeys, and within that, an Indian single malt that we, you could take global. Similarly, you'll meet Zoravar Kalra later on, who's the founder of Massive Restaurants. We're taking Farzi Cafe, the restaurant brand, global. So we're opening in London, we're opening in the Middle East. And so not, uh, are we, we're not just tapping uh, consumer demand in India, but we're also taking these brands, uh, basically bottling what is best of India for global markets. And finally, our investment in Chumbak Designs. I think there the thesis was very simple, um, that women, I know you mentioned souvenir, We've significantly transformed since that point. A chumbak, as you know, is, is uh, Hindi for magnet. It was meant to, it started off as a fridge magnets company, but today it's a lifestyle retail brand and is very unique because it focuses almost entirely on young women. Um, and so this is, this is another example of, you know, the one and a half trillion dollar of consumer spend, which identifies emerging consumers uh, and creates, uh, you know, innovation and value uh, in specific areas.
Thank you, Imran. Uh, Ketki, if I can come to you. Uh, two recent investments in Future and Impresario. Uh, what was L. Catterton's thinking? Yeah. So, um, so some very interesting uh, data points uh, shared by Imran there. And uh, we are, as you know, a consumer sector-focused fund globally. So uh, consumer is uh, all we understand, all that we do. And we are very, um, globally, we are very category focused, right? So we tend to take a view on certain uh, categories and themes and then deep dive there and, and then try and identify players which are uniquely positioned to leverage the cat category thrust to really um, build scale. Um, but in India, uh, we have uh, faced an additional uh, complication, right? So I would like to just touch upon the, the rel relative complexity of the Indian market. Um, you know, that has also led to this kind of a dichotomy as it relates to uh, the so-called heroes and, and those who have sort of languished, right? And, and, that's, uh, and that's for the following reasons, right? Uh, the, the market is fairly uh, heterogeneous as it relates to consumers. Right, so I often joke about uh, you could be living in the same building, but your consumption habits could be very different from your immediate neighbors, uh, which is very unlike what you'll see in a China or a US. And I, even if I was to draw parallels of uh, China circa 2007, when they were a GDP um, sort of $2,000 uh, economy, roughly where we are today. Um, I, I like to use this anecdote, uh, given that we have uh, sort of early association with LVMH group. Uh, Louis Vuitton had about 30 stores in China uh, circa 2007. Um, currently in India, we are just pushing four, right? So uh, it, it's an interesting anecdotal evidence of the fact that uh, just rising incomes doesn't necessarily translate to high scale, uh, particularly in certain categories, just given the behavioral nuances and the preferences of the Indian consumer. Uh, so what we have discovered along the way is, um, is, uh, is the challenge around backing, uh, creating businesses that truly disrupt. And disrupt is a much abused uh, term, but the way we interpret it is uh, trying to do s something which is uniquely serving your consumer as it relates to product, as it relates to distribution and technology. And what we've seen is across any category, uh, the people who have succeeded or the companies that have actually thrived have been the ones who have been able to do that well. Whether it was Fab India, we've been early um, sort of partners with Fab India and now Rochelle and team are, are there in the business and we're very proud of what that company has achieved. But before they came along, there was no one really serving ethnic Indian wear uh, to an urban consumer in the way and fashion they were. Similarly, what Manyavar has done in the men's ethnic wear category or what Go Colors is trying to do in the sort of bottom wear category, right? All of these categories were, are, uh, A, they are non-existent elsewhere in the world. Uh, B, uh, they were sort of even non-existent from an Indian standpoint if one was to look at the organized sector penetration for some of these categories. But we've seen companies truly evolve and deliver uh, growth in terms of scale and all the positive economics that come with it just by being very close to what the consumer uh, needs from them, right? So I can enumerate several examples. Uh, Riaz and Impresario are trying to do, again, something very interesting with social which again is a unique uh, pub, restaurant, casual dining, uh, team co-working space format, right? Which sort of shape shifts based on time of day and day of the week. Uh, so we're trying to identify some of these really unique players within categories that have a natural thrust and try and partner with them in some way. Thank, Thank you. you. Ketki, very interesting points. Uh, Tarun, uh, if you can, you've invested a lot in food uh, from CX, can you Talk us through what, uh, how you view that category and what your thoughts are. Um, so uh, what we look for in the consumer space is market leaders in certain niches. So uh, Barbecue Nation was our first investment in the food space, that, and we invested uh, across three years. So, uh, so we basically did another round. So the first time we invested in them was 2013, but we met them as early as uh, December of 2011. At that point in time, they had close to about 25, 26 stores. Uh, sorry, they had 19 stores. By the time we invested, they went up to 26. And each one of their stores was doing close to two and a half, three table turns a day, which made their store payback 
less than two years. Uh, return on capital of 35-40%. Uh, very lucrative, and this is 2011-12. Uh, that time the business was only about 180 crores in revenue, but 180 crores in revenue in those days probably is like 700-800 crores today. Uh, so it made it a, a market leader in a particular niche. The niche that they were targeting was a value customer. At that time it was about 520 rupees, all you can eat, uh, as much as you want to eat or whatever. Uh, so that market didn't, you know, that, uh, that customer was looking for that particular product, it didn't exist. Uh, and that's where the explosive growth came. So they are close to about 127, 128 stores now. They open a store every two weeks. Uh, by the end of the year, hopefully, there will be 150 stores. They have maintained the same store level economics. Uh, the stores that they opened two years ago still have a payback of about two, two and a half years. Uh, so scalability, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges that restaurants are facing. And if you're a consumer investor in India, you will end up investing in restaurants. It's a big category. Uh, like Imran mentioned, uh, the explosive incremental consumer spend, which currently is about five, $600 per capita, will go to about $1,000. It's gonna go 2X in three years. Uh, and a large part of what you spend beyond your basic needs is going to be on eating out, entertainment, etc. So if you are a consumer investor in India, you have to look at restaurants. Uh, within restaurants, uh, what do you invest in? And, and we have invested in, a, in another business called Sapphire Foods, which is the second largest uh, franchisee for Yum. They have about 410 odd stores of Pizza Hut and KFC in South India, uh, Western India and Sri Lanka. Uh, that's QSR, uh, but the challenge there is something different. Uh, they have growth. We add 60 stores a year, so growth is not a concern. But then the store payback there is nine years. Uh, so the return on capital in that business is 10%. Uh, so as a, as a financial investor, uh, how, do you, how do you make money on such investments? Of course, there is growth, so we will get uh, incremental investors to come in and pay a higher multiple. Uh, but fact of the matter is the underlying business has to generate cash. Uh, and, and we are facing similar problems in Burger King. Burger King's growing leaps and bounds, done fantastically well. But if you look at return on capital, it's poor. Uh, so that's one of the things that's really uh, an issue in, in the restaurant space. Uh, so we look for uh, these kind of niches. Uh, similarly, the third business that we invested in uh, three years ago was Mrs. Bechter's Foods. Uh, this is the biscuits and the breads business. So the thesis there was that they were present in five states in North India. Uh, good brand, uh, good product, decent distribution. Uh, but the family was not growing the business aggressively. They needed somebody to come in and help them uh, support uh, the growth, higher management, Im improve distribution. Uh, so we've done that, so we are in uh, 12 states now. Uh, so that's, so there the investment thesis was basically taking a good brand and going uh, pan-India. Uh, the other uh, thesis in Sapphire Foods is something which I think is pretty much common across all consumer investors in India, is that what is tier three today in four or five years will become a tier two city. And the way you define it is by number of schools, number of colleges, car dealerships, uh, hotels, uh, ATMs, et cetera. Uh, and as a city goes from tier three to tier two, there's a huge change in the consumer dynamics for that city or that town as a whole. Uh, there is a public market investor called Anand uh, uh, Akash Prakash, who runs Amansa Capital in Singapore, he wrote an article about this in Monday's uh, Business Standard about the three categories of households that we have in India and how uh, the bottom-most category actually has tripled in the last 10 years. But now it's the middle category that's going to grow the fastest over the next five years. So, uh, so he mentioned that if you look at two-wheelers, uh, they've grown at an average of like 23 24% in the last 20 years, but now that, that growth's going to slow down, and it's the four-wheelers that are going to grow. Uh, so there's a shift in consumption pattern. Uh, but don't get me wrong, India is and always will be a value-oriented market. 
there is no uh, brand loyalty. Today, if a competitor comes up and opens a store next to Barbecue Nation and sells the same product for 10% lower, we will lose our footfalls to that competitor. There is no brand loyalty. People basically value you at the margin. Uh, so as a consumer business owner, it's basically a daily, uh, it's a day-to-day -day business. You have to know what you're selling. You have to know who your customer is. You have to know who your product is because disruption is just around the corner. Uh, so we are facing a lot of competition from Swiggy. Uh, we have two restaurant businesses, Barbecue Nation, even though the concept is very different, they are facing competition. Swiggy, uh, so for, uh, for, for uh, Pizza Hut and KFC, it's a direct threat uh, because the same product that you're selling in your store is 20% cheaper if you buy on Swiggy. And Swiggy has got money to burn, right? They've just raised a billion dollars. The stated objective is to burn $2 million a day uh, we're just trying to make $2 million a year. So, uh, so it's a tough market. Hi, good morning. Um, we call ourselves the Roti Kabra Makan investors because that is the basic need of the Indian consumer. And uh, we're very excited to cater to brands which are catering to this need. Just sort of adding to what Imran had said in our fundraise presentations, very similar, but uh, a metric that we've been big fans of is, you know, since 2001 to say 15, in the middle class, we've added an entire population of the United States in 15 years, right? So there is that really big chunk of the middle income population that is sitting there, waiting to open their wallets and spend. So when we look at investments, we try to see how the brands are straddling across these consumption needs. And what we've also thrown into that pack now, after Roti Kapta Makan, is health and wealth. So I'll talk to you about some of the investments that we've done that sort of cater to this bucket. So within food, we backed a business called Bikaji Foods way back in 2013. And I remember when I was walking the markets in Rajasthan and Bihar, you know, consumers used to go to a Kirana Dukan and Theli Me Bujia Leke Jate the, right? And that has sort of shifted to a branded Bujia packet. You know, you go to a Marwari house, you have poha, you want to put bujia on top of it, right? So everything is sort of organized. So the theme that we played there was in the ethnic snacks, people going to Kirana Dukans now want to buy a branded bujia or a namkeen packet versus taking it in a theli. So that was one of the themes that we looked at. If you look at kapda, we realized that the Indian consumer after eating well also wants to look good. It's cliched, but it looks, they want to look good. So we invested in a business which is called Nika, And we don't see it more as a technology play, we see it as a personal care play. And it is fabulous when we look at data. Cities like Aligarh, Chandigarh, Ludhiana, these are the top consuming um, uh, cities. And why? Because see, earlier, if you remember, you would tell your uncle or your chacha when they were going to London, get me a Bobby Brown or a Mac or whatever, because those stores were not available. Today, Nika is making those brands available to the Indian consumer. And we saw this trend because we were investors in Kama Ayurveda way back in 2014. And in a jiffy, e-commerce became a significant portion of our sales, although we have a very strong retail footprint as well. So there were two things happening. One was digital disruption in the in the way the channel was developing for personal care. We used to earlier think, no, I will only go to a store and try a lipstick color and then I would buy it. But increasingly we were seeing women are far more comfortable experimenting with stuff online. So we saw the digital disruption there and obviously everyone wants to look better. So these brands were straddling. Small example, if you've heard of this lady called Huda, uh, she's an Instagram um, uh, phenomenon and my retail therapy on Instagram. Um, where, you know, she used to put these uh, makeup videos and when they decided to come exclusive into India, Nika was the exclusive partner and on day one, the sales was a million dollars with absolutely no marketing, no ATL, no BTL, nothing, right? So I'm just saying the consuming power is huge, right? Coming to, um, you know, uh, Makan, we invested in a business called Sarah Sanitary Wear and the, and, and the big push there was, look, Everyone's going to build houses and you will need toilets. And the toilet penetration in India was very poor. So we sort of looked at it differently. You know, we've invested in a laminates business all to do with how, real, you know, uh, uh, we could not invest in real estate, 
but with housing consumption, you want to live in better houses, so you would invest in building materials as well. So I guess our overall theme has sort of been consumption, but we are now looking for pockets within each of the spaces, niches, as, as uh, Tarun mentioned. Say, for instance, within food, now, you know, ethnic namkeen has become a huge category, but then you have categories which are taking on shelves today in the retail space. For instance, idli batter. I think ID Fresh has done a phenomenal job with creating that category. Win greens with their dips, so on and so forth, which were not categories present earlier. You would go to a US shelf or a China shelf. This has been there for ages, right? So these are some of the categories which are growing. They have different set of challenges, and I think we are privy to what we can do to work with those challenges, but these are some of the niches, right? Within lifestyle to, uh, you know, Imran's point on Chumbak, uh, uh, you know, and now women want to look far more better and interesting products they don't mind spending. So I think one is obviously consumption within the main categories and then niches within them. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, all of you have touched on various points, very interesting points as well. If we can now delve into some of those, uh, you know, points that you mentioned. Uh, the chief concern for most companies after they've decided that this is the idea that they're going to work on is how to build scale. Uh, so I wanted to, you know, get some thoughts from all of you on uh, what, on how do you build scale and, uh, you know, specifically on whether, how do you help companies, say, expand geographically on, on various, uh, in, you know, in various territories. Uh, Imran, if uh, I can invite you to make comments, sir. Thank you, Ranjini. So, you know, I, I, uh, my um, second job was in a pharmaceutical company. Um, when you bring pharmaceutical drugs to the market, there is a concept of lab scale and, and factory scale, right? And there's a, there's a science to it, because what works in the lab doesn't work at large uh, scales in the factory. You have a similar problem in consumer. Um, so we see a plethora of companies that are, let's say, sub $10 million in revenue, which at some point will just plateau and don't get to uh, 100 million, leave a billion, right? And so um, I think the skill, uh, so first of all, what we think we do well is to identify those $10, $20 million companies and get them firmly on a path to a billion. We don't stay till a billion, we exit uh, along the way. Right. But that's what we do, and I just wanted to, uh, so first of all, I resonate with that. So what, what do we look for and what do we do with these companies? So the starting point for us is validated unit economics. And I know that this is almost a cliche, but um, you know, six out of 10 proposals that we see have just broken unit economics. And you know, it doesn't take a lot of um, work to figure out that these will just never scale because your revenues can get to a billion dollars by throwing a lot of capital, but you're never going to really make money or create value. Um, and so what do we mean by unit economics? In categories that are parallel, it's 65% gross margin. You know, in other categories, it's, so the range is anywhere from 35% to 65% in the way that we understand gross margin, because I know that when you speak about e-commerce, you have almost three or four flavors of margins. You have uh, gross margin, you have contribution one, contribution two, contribution three, and it's difficult to figure out what they mean. But what we mean by gross margin is all direct costs out whether it's performance marketing, call it whatever, right? Um, so first of all, validated unit economics. Second is some evidence that the brand has created a cult um, beyond its you know, early adopters. And that's also you know, easy to do through surveys and so on. In, in some cases, um, like retail, for example, that could mean have you successfully expanded beyond the first city? Right? For other brands that have national appeal, uh, Nika, for example, which has national appeal, it's not uh, restricted to any geography, is there evidence that you have repeat purchase of a certain, uh, of a certain type? Uh, is there cohort level increases? Uh, which I know is true about Nika, so very, very uh, uh, you know, congratulations on that one. And so when you start seeing these unit economics showing up, you know that you have gone beyond the initial early adopter cohort uh, and you're ready to scale. And therefore, what investors like us do is we, we take execution risk. Right. So once you have a, a, you know, a, validated, a product with validated unit economics and you have a channel that has gone beyond its first cohort, um, then capital can uh, you know, really work. And, and to Tarun's example of Barbecue Nation, once you have you know, a model that gives you those kind of ROCs and paybacks, then it's just a function of multiplying the number of stores. 
and doing it intelligently. Uh, Kate, Kate, if I can ask you, you actually invested in companies that are fairly scaled up. So from there, how do you, you know, look at uh, taking them to the next level? And also some of your, you know, if you can kind of add on to what Imran has said about scale in general. Sure. So I completely echo everything that Imran said because these are effectively principles which, uh, which sustain and endure, right? So these are universally acceptable no matter uh, what stage of evolution the business is in, right? So in, in, in our case, uh, we, I think relatively speaking, have come in a slightly more mature businesses, but I think the, the principle that uh, even Tarun mentioned earlier, I think the critical uh, piece for us uh, as it relates to our evaluation of unit economics is, is clearly uh, the growth uh, for that unit, whether that has uh, sort of endured over a period of time, along with the payback and the return on capital employed at the unit level, right? So once uh, we are able to um, crack that, uh, and it, it's different for a, re, uh, for a apparel store, it's different for a restaurant, uh, as, and, as my, uh, both my colleagues uh, Imran and Tarun mentioned, but it, it's still um, it's relevant because that is essentially where your uh, capital allocation uh, decisions uh, will go. Uh, so, so that is one, uh, one natural metric uh, that remains uh, relevant. The other important aspect is scale is very different for different businesses, right? Because it, it has a lot to do with the product resonance for the specific audience that you're catering to. Uh, one interesting uh, thumb rule that I like to use when I speak of whether the product has resonance is it should evoke some kind of a reaction and some kind of chatter amongst the audience. And the chatter could be positive. Uh, could be negative, but it should not be where people are like, yeah, it's there, but doesn't really make a difference. So when you have some kind of conversation going, uh, that is when things start getting interesting, right? Now, even beyond there, uh, scaling across three, uh, across our five metros is very different from uh, scaling uh, in the top eight cities and then going beyond that. Uh, but for example, we've had some very interesting experience with Impresario, much similar to what Rochelle mentioned with Nika, right? So when we uh, backed Riaz um, about 18 months ago, uh, he was present only in three cities, which is Bombay, Delhi, and Bangalore. And uh, he had phenomenal unit economics, which we thought would be dilutive as most units come along, but uh, he's managed to, he and his team have done a phenomenal job defending it in a fairly competitive market. Uh, but we um, uh, sort of... Last year, which is early 2018, we opened our store in Chandigarh. And, and that has just hit the ball out of the park, right? We didn't expect that kind of reaction from a market like Chandigarh. So, so I think uh, Indian cities are ready. Uh, uh, Indians are craving unique concepts. Um, and are, like you said, the way you discover brands is also very different now, right? There's a lot of um, interesting discovery happening on social media, a lot of talk and buzz being created there. So you almost have instant feedback on, on brand uh, resonance and whether what you're trying to do is something different and uh, creative. So, so that, is, uh, that is the way we look at it. Coming to your question around scaled up brands, I think the challenge continues. So Brand Factory, uh, which is quite established, but is continuing to grow at a very high clip. They're adding about 40 stores every year. And there again, the challenge is uh, now going into deeper penetration with lower tier cities and identifying the, the, the micro markets there uh, where there is aspiration to consume brands but add a value, right? So, so the thesis plays out. I think our job is really to, uh, to sort of play the role of a strategist, zoom out, uh, draw the entrepreneur to the big picture opportunity and I think very important to help him prioritize and focus on what is essential. I think entrepreneurs are very intelligent, very smart. Uh, they have a visceral sense of what works, uh, which no private equity fund can, you know, can adopt in a formulaic manner. And that is really where they spike. Uh, but what we can do is just put it in a more analytical framework and help them focus on, on what's priority. Uh, and, and that's all we do. Thank you. Kiki. Uh, Tarun, I wanted to ask you about platforms. Uh, is that a good way for companies to build scale in evolving categories? Uh, so uh, we actually have a platform investment in the consumer space. So Sapphire Foods, uh, so before we actually uh, bought it, and it's a full buyout between us, Samara and Goldman, 
so, so we bought it in 2016. So before we actually bought it, it was seven different franchises. And uh, we went to Yum and we said, we want to help you consolidate. Uh, so we actually went out and bought all seven of them and put it together. But so that was, you know, you can call it a platform, but it was a premeditated platform as in you knew that you want to buy these. Uh, the other way to do it is what the classical definition is, is maybe to acquire a brand and then buy maybe complementary businesses around that brand. Now, if you were to buy a B2B business uh, or a healthcare business uh, or even a financial services business, most of it is back-ended. A consumer business, uh, so for example, Massive has done it. So they have four or five different uh, brands. Uh, to some extent, uh, Anjan Chatterjee did it. Uh, we tried to do it in Barbie Nation as well. So we bought Johnny Rockets uh, two years ago. We, they had five stores. We added another three stores. It didn't work out. Uh, because culturally, uh, the, uh, you know, Barbecue Nation is known for all-you-can-eat food. Uh, Johnny Rockets was a la carte. Didn't really work out. So we had to shut that down. Uh, but if you, if you were to grow, if you were to do a platform, it has to be something which, uh, which your back end is used to managing. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, we have, uh, so till about three years ago, our 80 odd stores that we had in Barbecue Nation were predominantly in nine or 10 cities. Today we have 120 stores that are in 56 cities. So incrementally we've gone to the tier two, tier three city. And the challenge there is, uh, so we had a central kitchen. As a matter of fact, in Bangalore, we had three central kitchens. Uh, because we have like 14 stores there. Uh, so how can you set up a central kitchen for one store in Guwahati? You can't. So the back end had to be managed. And that's really the biggest scalability problem uh, when it comes to growth in restaurants. Uh, beyond a point, you have to go to the 30th, 40th, 50th, 60th city and town in India to grow. And when you go there, uh, how do you manage logistics? Uh, so we have in the last 18 months in Barbecue Nation hired... Uh, dietitians and food technologists to actually help us uh, backward integrate our entire uh, supply chain. So the chicken comes pre-marinated from the vendor in cold storage to the Guwahati store. Uh, it comes from Venkis. Uh, similarly for prawn, similarly for fish. Uh, right, so the dry rations are a lot easier. But that's a key challenge. How many people can actually afford it? Our food cost has gone up by 2.5% because of that. Uh, and, you and in a tier 2, tier 3 city, you can't price it. Uh, so those are, the, those are some of the challenges that you will face uh, when you try to put together uh, smaller brands. Uh, but maybe not in the restaurant space, but you can probably do it in the apparel space. Uh, because that's a market that is growing, especially in the women's apparel side. Uh, I think the men's apparel is pretty much done. Uh, but on the women's apparel, on the ethnic side, there is a lot of room to play. Uh, Rochelle, I wanted uh, some thoughts from you on how you're, you know, scaling Tainor and Wow Momos, uh, some of these brands, and, you know, how, what your uh, scaling plans are. So, uh, while I'll take some of the examples that we've invested in, but... The broad concept is that we've backed companies anywhere in revenue sizes from, say, um, maybe about 50-odd crores to as much as 2,000-odd crores, right? So that's the typical sort of revenue size. And as Ketki mentioned, I think scale is a question that happens at every stage of a company. But the broad principles that we sort of try and follow, because I think the promoter's vision is spectacular, right? right. And he or she has the right to dream in any angle possible because they are so passionate about it. And the role that we typically play is, okay, we have all these various ideas. How do we boil that down into simple concepts right. so that they are achievable and attainable? Because everything is nice to be done, but what do we do on priority? I absolutely echo what you said. Um, so there, we typically look at three ways of doing it. Right. It boils down to that, which is either you look at product expansion or you look at market expansion or you look at category expansion. Right. So I'll, I'll talk to you about some of the businesses and where we've had the idea of scale. 
So for instance, product. We've invested in a business called Wow Momo, again, which is in the QSR space. Right. Momos as a concept, how much can you scale Momos, right? But, you know, when we invested, this business had about under 100 stores. In a matter of two years, we are at about 280 stores. Right, right? now, how, do you, how are you able to do this and do it at a scale of very good profitability at corporate level, not at store level, but corporate level, right. you know, where you have double digit EBITDA margins. Right. Now, you're only able to do that when you have your backend and your supply chain absolutely sorted out. Right. So it's a cookie cutter model, it's a unitized model, central kitchen, you have your wastages and your costs under in. All you need to do is replicate that in every city, right? right? So that's what we've done with Wow Momo. So there, now what we are doing is we are trying to now get into a different product segment, which is Wow China, right? right? It has its whole other set of food cost issues. Right. But then again, go back to the drawing board in terms of how do you rein in on your supply chain right. and your costs, make it cookie cutter unitized. Right. So there we've addressed product expansion and we've addressed market expansion. Right. Now, say another business, for instance, Bikaji Foods, right? right? When we invested, this was predominantly a single state play, predominantly. Today, we are leaders in three states and we have penetration in nine states, right? From a business of 300 crores to 900 crores in uh, practically four years. Now, how we were able to do this is because we looked at channel distribution and how is it that we can take every state and look at traditional distribution and, you know, plug in the holes there. So scale there comes from market expansion. And sometimes, you know, we tend to get obsessed with, nee, humko pan India brands mein hi invest karna hai. Sometimes it's, it's good to be regional. And many of the business models by virtue of it have to be regional. For instance, spice brands or dairy brands, so on and so forth. You cannot become pan India for the very nature of the business. So I guess there you have to look at regional expansion. In terms of category, I think this is something that Fab India has done phenomenally well. We used to be largely ethnic apparel, and Ketki will know this. We've gotten into personal care and organic food. We have Organic India as a business. So I guess there we've taken the Fab India umbrella and sort of scaled it to these various other lifestyle brands. So today, Fab India no longer talks about kurta pajama, but it is more a lifestyle, right? Fab India, anyone who is a true consumer will echo with it. So I guess every company, and I've, I've spoken of companies at different scales and sizes. Right. So I guess you'll have to look at it from a different strategy standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we are, we are actually quite short of time and I had a lengthier list actually. But you know, I, I think at the core of every company is the founder. And one of the things I wanted to ask you all, especially in a consumer company, which is, you know, a place fairly in an unorganized market. They're cash rich, they don't really need money. What are the concerns that founders, you know, come to you with? What, what is it that they ask? What are the questions they ask you? If you can kind of uh, give us a sense on, uh, on that. Rochelle, I know you have a lot to uh, say on that. Okay, so we typically invest in brands and businesses which are in not in largely the metro cities. You know, we have a business in Saharanpur. We have three businesses in Chandigarh. Chandigarh is uh, developed. Uh, but, you know, uh, Bikaner, so on and so forth, right? So I think largely the questions that I get from promoters, five years back was, what is private equity? I mean, what do you guys do? I mean, how is it different from bank debt? It's far more simpler, right? Today, I think the questions are far more evolved. But I think a large apprehension that family-driven businesses have, which we typically sort of cater to, is a fine line between interference and involvement. And I think that's a, a, a fine line that we as investors have to straddle. At times, it, it requires interference, but with some amount of input where they can appreciate it. So the way we've done or we've sort of tried to allay that apprehension is that we build relationships with these entrepreneurs several years even before making the investment, right? We know these businesses for a minimum of two to maybe seven years before we've invested. So it takes a long time to sort of invest in these businesses. And overall, I think it's about telling them that, look, we are, you know, we have this thing called good partners at good times, but better partners at the bad times. We've gone through our fair share of trouble where businesses have not always grown or the industry hasn't sort of been the best friend. But how do you sort of get back to the drawing board and sort of understand what their pain points are and help them? Today, 
how promoters view us is an extended bandwidth of their team. And I think that's a, fin it's, it's an, it's a very fantastic situation to be in because whether you have, say, they have hiring needs, they would look to you to say, okay, Rochelle, can you get me a CXO? Earlier, it used to not be that way. Used to, you had to push someone to give maybe 50 lakhs of salary. Hey, boss, you know, the, the highest salary is only 20 lakhs. What is this 50 lakhs, right? Now we don't have those conversations. They themselves say, can you help us build this? You know, can you help us with marketing? Can you help us with the ERP system? So I think the conversations are far more evolved now. And I think it's a very interesting... Uh, space to be in. Uh, Tarun, what are your thoughts? I think uh, now the uh, the promoter has uh, is a lot more evolved, a lot more mature, uh, understands what he wants to do with the business, uh, understands what uh, the advantages and disadvantages are of private equity. Uh, but one of the things that uh, at least that we've seen uh, and and uh, frequency has only increased in the last three or four years, is that as these promote, uh, most of the businesses that we look at are family-owned, mid-market businesses, uh, largely promoted, driven by his family, someone who's between 40 and 60 years of age. Uh, uh, so they, I've seen a lot of interest where promoters are saying, uh, I want to sell eventually because my, my kids don't want to do this. Uh, so can you help me sell this business, but not now, maybe after five years? Uh, so take 51%, take 75%, take whatever, 30%. Uh, I know how to run my business. And most of the time they do, you know. Um, so, so you buy a business for $100 million value. Uh, he may not be able to take it to $500 million, but the guy built a business that's $100 million in value. So he's a smart guy. Uh, most, most of the promoters that I deal with are smarter than me. Uh, so... Uh, uh, so basically what they're saying is that we know broadly how to run this business, we, but to take it from X to 4X, that's where I want to sell it. I can't do it myself. Uh, can you help me hire a management team? Can you help me professionalize the systems and processes so that if I go off for a month uh, for a vacation, the thing doesn't fall apart? Uh, so things like that. So his requirements today are not what they were 10 years ago, that please give me cash and you know, and, and, and come to the board meeting once a quarter and I'll send you MIS every month. That's not what it is. Uh, and there are enough in many private equity funds that'll, uh, you know, that'll buy businesses. Uh, but the idea is you got to get the right set of uh, promoters. And internally for us, the bar is actually a little higher uh, to work in a minority situation because then the promoter is in control. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's up to him to get you, get you an exit. Uh, we are willing to dilute the quality of the promoter that we work with if it's a if it's a control situation, because then we know that we we sell this business strategically. Uh, so I think that's where the uh, you know the, the promoters in India have actually evolved in the last five or six years. That's good to hear. KT, your thoughts? Yeah, I think uh, I echo everything that uh, Tarun and Rochelle highlighted as it relates to what motivates promoters and, and also the kind of skepticism they have when they view uh, new partners coming in with a shorter duration. Uh, we, uh, we often like to joke that uh, in our business, uh, it's a little bit like uh, a sort of a, a very happy marriage, but with a divorce contract built in, right? Because we are not there for the whole hog. Uh, we are there only for a, for a limited period of time. And, and it's very important to align with, uh, with the founders uh, towards a shared vision. And, and this seems a bit cliche, uh, but it's extremely relevant uh, because every founder, uh, uh, you know, obviously there are, they are evolving over time, but they still have some subjectivity around what really drives them. For some, it could be long-term value, value creation in the business. For some, it could be legacy, you know, the promises that they've made uh, to their employees who've been with them over time. And, you know, so they want to create something that's, that really is path-breaking. So they have all sorts of uh, visions. And, and it's very important to have empathy, uh, to understand what really drives uh, founders, and to have this partnerial approach where the roles are very clearly defined. 
in terms of you know where where the two can complement each other and sort of try and win this game, uh, so to speak. Uh, so uh, so that is somewhere where we spend a lot of time. Uh, and it's often understood, but not fully appreciated, and it takes a little bit of time uh, to get there. Uh, but once, once that's achieved, ideally prior to investment, then the relationship uh, ends up being uh, very um, sort of, res uh, you know, sort of that built on mutual respect and uh, regard for what the other person brings to the table. So with private equity, it's more about augmenting the organization as it relates to systems, processes, people. Right, that's the that's what we like to say. And with the entrepreneur, it's it's the entire animal spirits, energy, vision, creativity. So the two have to be complemented uh, in order to build an organization that that uh, sort of that wins in the long term. And and that's what uh, we try and accomplish. Uh, with them. Thank you, thank you, Kiki. Imran. Also, if you can address how you uh, address founder apprehension, apprehensions, you know. Sure. So just a quick context, you know, India, India is changing at many levels, but Indians' relationship with money has also fundamentally changed. So if you, if you look at, uh, and, and there are some very good ones from the older generation, but if you see some of the entrepreneurs from the older generation, their relationship with money was tax saving, cash flow, uh, you know, that was the conversation around the dinner table. Today you go to a Bangalore, Delhi, Bombay, you see some of these new age first generation entrepreneurs of the kinds that we back. You know, they are typically VC backed. They understand the language of venture capital. They're extremely demanding of you on the value that you will add. They will, in fact, interview you, um, uh, the good ones. And they will, they will uh, you know, in the prenup, since we're talking about prenups, they will, in the prenup, ask you for the value that you're going to add. What are the specific skills you bring to the table? And the relationship with money has gone beyond money, it's wealth. So um, that. I think that's a great opportunity for investors like us, and we are certainly leveraging it. How do you self-select the entrepreneurs who have made peace with the fact that they want to create a billion dollars, right. and that the billion dollar wealth creation is far more important than being a promoter on, on the Iron Throne, uh, right? I think that is, uh, I think, one, one aspect. But however, you know, to your second question, uh, the good entrepreneurs that we want to back always have apprehensions, because that's the whole process of evaluation. And we've been preparing this for a while. Uh, we are high-touch investors. We, we bring to the lower mid-market what large buyout firms build, bring to billion-dollar companies, right? And what does that mean? Half of our team have operating backgrounds. So we've got three CFOs, we've got two CHROs. And so when we're sitting across the table with a founder and we're talking about what it takes to take your brand from lab scale to industrial scale, there is an assertion that everything has got to change. Your corporate team, you have to start focusing on yield, uh, you know, everything, everything will fundamentally change, but you know what? Here is the package of skills and expertise and people who will work closely with you to help you build that out. And so that's basically the handshake, um, you know, beyond everything else. Thank you. We'll end it here. Thank you uh, to the panel, and thank you to the audience for listening.